has asked me to help with part of the interim process, which is history, and also to kind of give insights as to why things are the way they are and stuff that's happened and like that. So, with that, we're going to talk about the history of the UCC and some holiday tunes. Next. Okay. Long time ago in an America far, far away. 1957. After World War II, when it was clear how dangerous we could be to each other and the planet, uh, people wanted to be united in ideas, in our hearts. So, that this wouldn't happen, and nation states only offered one perspective. The church, of course, offered another one. We tried differently, different things. Politically, we had the United Nations. Legally, we had the World Court. And religiously, we tried, click, humanism. This is the idea being that if we could all agree on what God wanted, we could have peace rather than annihilation. So, we formed the World Council of Churches. Many denominations around the world and in America, the United Church of Christ. All right. One church merged from two or er, four churches. And I'll explain what that's about in a little bit. But the two churches that merged in 1957 were the Evangelical and Reformed churches and the Congregational Christian Churches. Okay. Now we're going to roll it way back. And no, 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 not the, not the film, just the picture. All right. Way back at the beginning, there was only one church. The one with the Pope. Yep. Catholicism. And the Pope had the ability to decide which human beings would go to hell, yes, actually hell, by preventing people from going to church and allowing them to take communion. That is, if you were excommunicated, you couldn't take communion, and that removed you from the communion of saints, for example, the church, also known as. Okay, so, the picture so far in history. One church, one church only in Rome and New York, the Roman Empire and then Europe, and this is it. One true Catholic and Apostolic Church. Catholic only means universal. Okay? Now it means something else because of what we're going to talk about. Anyway, under the under that, the Pope and clergy were the ones who read the Bible and said what it meant. And the Pope by about 1200 was corrupt. So he would raise money and absolve you of all of your sins or not and could send your whole town to hell. Okay? The Pope would come in and say, we're going to have, we're going to raise money for the church. If you give, we'll pray extra hard for you so that you will go to heaven. If you don't do that, well then we'll just excommunicate you. And if a mayor of a town didn't like that, the Pope could threaten the whole town. Okay? So, people's eternal life and salvation could be messed with and they had no tools to argue. So, along comes Luther and the Reformation. Luther is a priest, because of course there's only one church, and he's a member of it. But Luther, being that smart guy that he is, says only God is in charge of salvation, and we can figure out if we're pleasing God 
by reading the Bible. So education becomes important, especially reading and figuring out how it applies to you, because you do it on an individual basis now, make salvation on an individual basis, not the whole church, just you and God. Luther wanted to reform the church, not split from it, because, well, he liked the Pope or liked the idea of the Catholic Church, but after a while it became apparent that that was not going to happen. So now our picture is two churches, two types of Christian churches, the Catholic Church and the Reformers, like Luther, which led to the Reformed Church. Okay. Now, Protestant is not the same as Reformed, oddly. Protestant is protesting the Catholic way of doing things. Protest is a part of our history. Anyone who is not Catholic is Protestant. Henry VIII, in his bid to marry one of his wives, decided he was going to divorce the old one, marry the new one, and for those of you that are Catholic, in the old days when you got divorced, what happened? Anybody? You got excommunicated. That's right. Okay. So Henry says, nah, uh, 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 uh. wait, 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 wait. And when the Pope is about to crown him, he takes the crown and he puts it on his own head. And he says, I'm in charge now. The Church of England is now formed. And that's how Protestantism happens. So Protestantism is about who's in charge on earth. Okay? Reformation churches had changed the way people thought about salvation, which is after this life. Luther was a very intelligent, brave man because he had to be. He was also very intense and very serious. Reformed churches tend to be all of those things. Anybody have any questions so far? Yes. So the Reformed Church is also a, a Protestant church. Yes. So it's Luther, a form of Protestant churches. So Lutheranism is Protestant. Yes. Okay. All right. So now we have three types of Catholic churches Catholic, Reformed, and the Church of England, or the Episcopalians. Okay? Now, later we'll end up with the Catholic churches. Reformed churches and a truckload of new types of reformed churches. German reform, Dutch reform, Polish reform, Slovak reform, and on and on. And then the Church of England and truckloads of other Protestant churches. Quakers, Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, etc. Okay? Alright. So, the E and R side, part one, is, starts with the reformed churches. German, Swiss, Polish, and other European countries, other churches rather, they are big on Luther, the Reformation, strict hierarchy, educated clergy, and they go by the term of Herr Pastor. That means their pastor is a guy. Okay? Herr Pastor is in German. Mr. Pastor. Okay? So, this is the Reformed Church. Their view of things is that lots of guilt leads to equality. That bad man over there, you're looking at a bum on the side of the street, that bad, old, bad man over there is bad. But so are you. So, you're equal. You shouldn't look down at him and you should do mission to help his miserable soul and yours. Okay. Congregational Christian, part one. The congregational churches. Anybody know of a congregational church? Okay. Congregational Christian churches start as congregational churches as this kind of mix and match thing. From the pilgrims, 
were sort of fun-loving folks from Pilgrim, from Plymouth, and Puritans, very stern, dour folks from Boston. They didn't so much merge as they intermixed and then became one. They are big on democracy, on soul freedom, soul freedom being that you and God can work things out. They're interested in voting on everything because they come from that Europe, from that English tradition where the Magna Carta came from. They're interested in that. They vote on everything from opinions to determine God's will. People, actually men, were free to and supposed to read the Bible and decide for themselves. The pastor was the most spiritual, wisest person to lead in general, but something you would never even imagine in the Reformed Church can be fired. Okay? Totally different dynamic. So in America's history, you have the right to believe what you want, the right to make decisions for yourself, the right to vote as part of the process, because you are created in the image of God. As it says in the Constitution, or now, excuse me, the Declaration of Independence, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are all congregational principles. Okay. So these churches are English, and that means they are concerned about, one, who makes decisions besides God about people's life, and for them, this life is important. Also, salvation and being pleasing to God are important, but, you know, once you're saved, you're always saved. So once that's done, you still got stuff to talk about. It's all about this life. Okay? So, Reformed churches are high church, like Catholics, they're very intense, they're very smart, they're very community oriented, and very guilt driven. They are very much salvation oriented. Okay? Jesus died for your sins, and if you believe, he'll be nice and allow you to get to heaven later. But since we're still here on earth and saved, we might as well make the most of our equally miserable lives until God gets here. That's the reformed way of looking at life. Okay, so in Europe we have the Catholics, the reformed churches, and the Church of England. In America, we have Protestant churches, of the free church tradition, which is they got free from oppression in England. And as time goes by, of course, immigrants bring European churches to American shores as well. Okay? Everybody following so far? Cool. Okay. So, E and R side. I already talked about the R, which is reform, but the evangelical churches are born of this thing in the 1800s called the Second Great Awakening, when people came to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and the preachers would preach for hours and hours and hours. Jonathan Edwards was a great preacher. That was what they called the First Great Awakening. In America, uh, in about the 1800s, the Second Great Awakening took place, and people felt like God was very active in American history, and probably around the world. So the evangelical churches come out of this time, they are spiritually reactive, they are into saving people's souls. Amazing Grace author John Newton who was a slave trader, has a conversion experience in the middle of the ocean. He stops his slave ship, turns around, brings the slaves back, stops being a slave trader, and becomes a traveling minister who preaches the gospel. And this leads to Methodism. Okay? 
but that, you know, there's no intelligence there, okay? I don't mean that he's not smart. What I mean is he didn't read necessarily read the Bible to get there or spend years of study behind a desk like Luther did. It's just a wham-bam experience, kind of like Paul, okay? All right, so then something happens. First Great Awakening we talked about, and that was a precursor to the Revolutionary War. Second Great Awakening, 1700s to 1840, and coming out of it, evangelicalism. Think of the Wild West. Worship has no formal structure because it needs to be open to the spirit. There aren't preachers around, but circuit, light, circuit writers like Wesley or, and I'm not sure I'm in there. But if there aren't teachers with the wagons, then education isn't going to happen. But that doesn't matter because for evangelicals, it's about being saved, like Newton, and spiritual experiences bringing you to God. There is no structure. Translation, you need to come to God, but you don't need to think about it, and you're free to live with as little structure as you need. Nobody can tell you what to do as long as you're saved. Okay? That's the evangelical side of things. But in the 1800s, Congregationalists, people who valued democratic principles and education, well, they started reading the Bible to slaves, teaching the slaves to read so that they could read the Bible. However, the slaves had different ideas. They started reading it. And they get to the part about Moses, and they're like, wait a second, what's this? Your God doesn't want us to be slaves? The congregation's like, no, 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 we didn't say that. We just said God didn't want those people to be slaves. Not stupid, they, they figure out, no, 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 this means us. So, they start reading other things like documents about their, their sale and all that kind of stuff. And after a while, after the Civil War, for lack of a better name, they become the Christian Churches of America. So the East Coast is congregational and Christian, and Reformed churches headed west and started their own churches. Evangelicals were already in the west. Midwest and South were evangelical and reformed churches. Ahead. So, in America, in the mid-1800s after the Civil War, Catholics, Protestants, Congregationalists and Episcopalians, reformed churches of many varieties, evangelicals, and freed slave Christians. And then, well then it all changed. World War I, brought with it nerve gas, Gatling guns, and many other horrors. People realized that we could destroy Earth people in war. And we thought to ourselves, let's not do that again. And then we had World War II. To destroy the people of the Earth and the atomic bomb, and with the atomic bomb, we can destroy the Earth that the people are on. Which brings us back to that ecumenism. Ecumenism in the 20th century, post-World War II. In America, there are dominant churches in the Midwest, and they merge to create evangelical and reformed churches. There are dominant churches in the East, congregational and Christian churches, depending on color and location. And they merge to form the congregational Christian churches. Some, some of them value the spirit. Evangelicals and Christians do. Reformed and Congregationalists do as well, but not as much. Worship is looser, more emotional, and aimed at the afterlife. That's their focus. There are little or no structure needed. 
church building isn't even needed. Evangelicals don't need to read, but Christians can't afford to because they're poor and they're black, and that's what we get. Okay. Now, for instance, this is the right off of a UCC page about the history of the Christian church. These are the five things. With a minimum of organization, other churches of like mind were established at the moment it became the Christian connection. Organized in 1820, six principles were unanimously affirmed. Christ is the only head of the church. The Bible is a sufficient rule for faith and practice. Christian character, the only measure for membership. The right of private judgment, interpretation of scripture, and liberty of conscience. The name Christian, worthy for Christ's followers, and the unity of all Christ's followers in behalf of the world. Know here that nowhere in there does it call Jesus Savior. There is nothing in this thing that everybody agrees on that starts with, do you believe Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Okay? So, that's, so some folks, some value, some of the denominations we've talked about, value intellect and the church. Reformed folks, first and foremost, rely on the educated clergy to look over them. Congregationalists are intellectual, and education is part of being a better person. Not becoming a better Christian or a more pious person, but a better person. Now these people do with the afterlife, but are also and are very much focused on this life. Okay? They acknowledge that heaven is coming, but they, yeah, okay. So in 1957, the United Church of Christ mushed all this together. The evangelical, where spirit leads to salvation, and the Reformed Church, where intellect, piety, order, and equality before God are merged with the Congregational Church that's liberal, intelligent, white, and reasoning, and the Christian Church, spiritual, practical religion. God comes here and frees the slaves, thank you. And salvation leads to change in this world to contrast heaven and earth. Okay? So, Sort of. The UCC began in 1957. All four denominations joined. But, because they're Congregationalists, nothing happens in the Congregational churches until the local church agrees to it. Okay? So, Congregational churches met about it, and on the local level, states, regions, areas, and local churches and if they didn't vote in, they didn't vote themselves in, they weren't UCC. Needless to say, this took a long time. Okay. For clergy, who had been studying ecumenism all this time, yeah, no problem. In many cases, though, clergy didn't pass on their knowledge to their congregations. And this lecture that you're now getting they didn't get. And the gap developed. So for the laity, it was kind of a mysterious thing being dropped on them that had to be explained. So, for those congregationalists who voted not to join the UCC became continuing congregationalist churches or conservative congregationalist churches. Those who joined and understood and those who came after that were straight out UCC. Congregationists who joined as part of official policy, they went to a, a, a regional annual meeting and everybody said, oh yeah, okay, we'll join the UCC, but didn't quite understand that, often kept the name Congregationalists in their name and did or didn't add UCC to their name later. I don't know about the history of this church. Hang on, go back for just a second. 
I don't know how this church was, but if I think about it out front, it says Center Congregational Church. Does it say UCC or not? Okay. I think you're still in the UCC anyway, but you would probably be in this category. We are UCC Church. Okay. Which is to say, until they voted, they weren't in the UCC. And their identity is strongly congregational, even within the UCC. Okay. So, the UCC claims historically to care about Jesus and the Bible, evangelicals and the Reformed folks, the Congregationalists, oh no, excuse me, the Christians, and sort of the Congregationalists. They claim to be informed by the Spirit. Evangelicals, yes. The Reformed Church, no, they're more intellectual. The Christian churches, again, and the Congregational Churches, sort of. To do something, UCC claims to do something in the present world with all of this. Evangelicals, until Jerry Falwell or so, didn't do anything in the present world because they were focused on the, the next world, the next world. Anyway, um, but the Reformed churches, congregational churches, and the Christian churches were all very into doing something in this world. Salvation, a.k.a. being saved from sin, they make a big fuss of it in the evangelical, the Reformed, and the Christian churches, Congregationalists, and not so much. Sometimes the Christian churches currently are the same thing. Education and rationality, the thinking churches out of the bunch are the Reformed and the Congregationalist churches, Evangelicals and the Christians, for reasons we've already discussed, not so much. Experience, Evangelicals, uh, congregationalists, evangelicals, and Christians, yes. Reformed church and congregationalists, yes, sort of. The afterlife, well, the evangelicals care about that the most. And the, the Christians, probably, also most. So the bunch of these balance each other out. Without balance, Evangelicals become megachurches and anti-intellectual. Reformed churches become all about order, piety, structure. They're law and order people. And they leave, actually in Europe, to Nazis. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who is a famous theologian, convinced his friends and other churches do a thing called the Barman Declaration. And the Barman Declaration says only God is God. Hitler is not. They were considered radicals and Bonhoeffer died in prison. Okay? He was fighting against the reformed churches he was a part of supporting Hitler because, well, Hitler was Hitler. Anyway, so that's what happens when reformed folks go off the deep end. When Christians go off the deep end, you get snake charmers, okay? Congregationalists go off the deep end, you get Unitarians, or godless harder. And over to the seminary I went to, is the last bastion of UCC done before Harvard. Harvard gets founded and the Unitarians and those people into light and creation, all these kind of esoteric, not specifically Christian people, that doesn't necessarily claim God. Next. Okay.
what we've balanced, all those four things, can hear God in a variety of ways. They can act in the world in appropriate ways. They care about heaven and earth. They represent the person and the work of Christ. A bit on that. Theologians tend to separate out the person of Christ and the work of Christ. The person of Christ is all the stuff Jesus did while he was alive. His teaching and all that kind of stuff. The work of Christ is the died and resurrected part. Okay? Because the died and resurrected thing is about salvation. The while Jesus is here thing is about this earth. Okay. So, there's a person who worked Christ. This leads to debates, arguments, and sinning. So, the reason that I called this the UCC and opinions, and why that's a good thing, is this. Okay? People in the UCC can argue about anything because it's all open. Okay? Every two or four years, and I don't remember which, um, Connecticut Conference sends people to a thing called Synod, which is somewhere in America that they pick. And so members of the UCC all get together. First they vote on what they're going to argue about, and then they argue. And then at the end of it, they come up with some good idea. Okay, and that all sounds well and good. So you'll hear these things like, the UCC believes this, or the UCC believes that. Who de do is what we say in congregational land, because congregations still have to vote on it to agree to it. Okay? We're part of the UCC, but when people say the UCC believes X and Y and Z, they mean the people at that synod came to that conclusion. Not that all people in the UCC agree to it, because congregations don't have to agree to anything. Okay? So, comes back here, people vote on it in your areas or whatever. But authority, in the end, belongs to the congregation. Okay, so here's my take on what's happened in this church's history for the last 20 years or so. The two most antithetical strains of the UCC, the evangelical side, my intellectual pastor is the spiritual head, and saving is more important in the process. It's not. We're hired. Yes, sir. John, uh, Lynn and I are going to have to apologize because we have a, a prior engagement, but before we left, I wanted to make a comment. Please. Um, a couple of things as I sit here. First of all, this is like a flashback history lesson to my confirmation class when I was in high school. Um, and I just hope, uh, and I'm so far removed from that today, and I just hope that from the standpoint of whoever's in charge of uh, the curriculum here at Center Church that if we're not using this we should get back to it because what I'm reflecting on here is about four years ago when we had meetings down in the basement here uh, where we had the parking lot sign and, you know where everybody was having all these discussions um, and I, I think of one particular member I won't mention name who I know had a question constantly well who are congregationalists what is congregationalism and this is phenomenal Okay. This kind of brought me back to my roots, and I don't know about anybody else here. Um, but my, my point is that, that I really appreciate this, and, and I think that this should be repeated and emphasized for folks who weren't here today, because this tells the story. It's now re reaffirmed for me why I'm here. And, and I appreciate it. I apologize. We have to go. But it's terrific. He's a member of the transition team, okay, <laughs> who asked me to do this, so we're in good shape. See you later. Take care. So this is the two most antithetical strains of the UCC, the evangelical side, 
which values anti-intellectualism and sees Asser as the spiritual head, for whom saving is important, process like the way we do things is not important, the last two pastors were that, and they were hired by a congregational church, which values intelligence, and, and the pastor is the convener. He's not the guy who says, this is right and that is wrong. He's the guy who convenes all the arguments. Okay? Saving, eh, not all that important to the UCC or the congregations. Not to say that it's not important at all, but it's not where our big emphasis is on. However, process is. Voting on everything is important. So this is what I think happened. The conflict with Reverend Fung, he's more evangelical. They brought him in to bring in more members. In the 1980s, there was a feeling in the UCC that we didn't know anything about the Bible. We went off and did all those protest marches and we didn't have any reason as to why we were doing that. Also, in about 1980, Ronald Reagan era, the term liberal became a swear word in public discourse. Somebody could call you liberal and it didn't mean good. Okay? So, the church hired somebody who seemed to go with the times. But this church, as it's in the UCC and it's congregationalist, it doesn't have to go with the times. So we have a little conflict. John, your last pastor, is evangelical, possibly reformed, because he went to Eaton Seminary, which is in Pennsylvania, in the heart of ENR theology. Okay? So he comes in and he thinks he's here pastor. He's the guy who makes the decisions on what's right for you. And there are people who like that. I mean, obviously, because the ENR churches thrive around the world. It's working for somebody, but it's not working for here. Okay? So they didn't fit the context here. This is not bad. They're not bad people. But without any balance, from all those yelling congregationalists, you get not my cup of tea. Okay. And that's it. So that's what I think happened, and why it happened, and why people are. Okay? The ENR side of things tends to be very strict doctrinaire. They have um, the Heidelberg Catechism. When kids go through confirmation class in the ENR, they do this thing called the Heidelberg Catechism, where the church reads you a question and you answer exactly as the catechism says. Is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Yes, and this is why. Congregations could no more do that without their head exploding than they could pull teeth. Okay? That's that style of doing things, that way of leadership doesn't fly here. Because that's not who we are. And you guys didn't even get to voting to be in the UCC until later. So congregationalism and voting on everything and everybody having an opinion and everybody arguing about stuff all the time and coming to a vote and deciding as a congregation how you want to move forward, that is who you are because that's your history. If whoever your next pastor is, when I'm done being interim, whoever your next pastor is, they need to understand congregationalism. And they need to understand the UCC. 
and they need to understand this town. Okay? So, I give you this information not to pick on anybody, not to say anything bad about anybody, but to explain how even good people get to a funky place. And that's where you were. Okay? But we have choices. And I'm more of a UCC guy. So what we're going to do here over the course of time is get that balance. Um, I'm probably politically liberal, maybe, I don't know. But theologically, I'm fairly conservative. In that, I want to talk about salvation. And I want to talk about prayer. And I want to talk about the irrational side of things right after we talk about the rational side of things and how to do things politically and in order. Okay, so what I want to do here is ask you who you are. I know history like this but that doesn't mean I have any clue about who you are as a people. And that's why I've been asking people to fill out cards saying, this is what I want in a church, this is what I don't want in a church, because that's how Congregationalists do everything. Okay? At the end, we'll collate it, we'll put it all together, and we'll come up with something. Now, for adult education, or teens if they want to. After we talk next week about how do we talk to each other without killing each other, how do we be nice Christians, we're going to talk about the Bible. We're going to spend Sundays for an hour going through Robert McAfee Brown's book, The Bible Speaks to You. Written in probably 1957 at the beginning of the UCC world. But it's still the best book I know about what's there and how it works and how to think about it and all that kind of stuff. Okay? His first chapter actually talks a bit about salvation and what it means to be born again or not, depending on how you understand that. Okay? So we're going to talk about the Bible, we're going to learn, and then in January, from January on until I don't know when, March, we'll do prayer. We'll learn how to pray, we'll practice praying, and having started a prayer group in seminary, because I didn't know what else people did there, can tell you that the weirdest things start happening when people pray. The story in this morning's worship about a guy whose sermon who was, well, both of them actually, a bio major who came across his call while working on starfish, and the man whose call was confirmed by a bum in the subway were both members of my prayer group, and both of them believed that what happened to them meant something different than what everybody else saw, okay? So when we pray, we open up the irrational side of our lives, okay? And let God do that stuff that only God can do. At the end of it, you will have the balance of head and heart, spirit and material, and the ability to fight like congregationalists and come across with what you, this particular church, in this particular spot, in this particular time, think God calls them to do. Okay? From there, it's just a question of implementing. So, over the course of the year, I hope to meet with each of the committees and ask them individually, what do you want? And if you're on the trustees, tell me what you want regarding the building. If you're in the deacons, tell me what you want about spiritual holy. If you're in the 
confirmation class, tell me what you want from the church for you. Whatever it is, we need to start by finding out who you are. So that when you go to hire somebody who's going to lead you, you get the person you want. And this church does the will of God. Okay? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.